Well, good morning. I'd like to invite you to the Gentian Financial Spring Forum. And with that, what I'd like to do is to uh, just go through a couple of different housekeeping items. Uh, we're doing this as a Zoom call, which is a little bit different than previous. And reason being is we're going to show slides on this one. This one is going to be a little bit more technical um, as far as in nature as well. So it'll be more like the slideshows that we show at the program at Blue Mom. We've been talking a lot, a lot about more of the caring and items that we have is how to deal with things mentally in our previous programs. So this one, we're gonna focus a little bit more on some of the different items that are gonna be uh, technical. What's behind the responses that we have as well. So we'll go through this in, in just a moment here. One of the very first thing, it's gonna be how to navigate bear markets is really what this is called. And I wanted to first thing show you what it is we were gonna serve you for lunch. So for those of you who are on the webinar who normally come to our program, for those of you who are normally on our program, I will want to show you this. You'll now see me as well through the magic of, uh, of Peter looking at me through the window and showing me I should be on the on screen with you. But this is what you are going to have. This is fantastic food that Doug prepared for you. So if you have food at home, I'm sure it's just exactly like this. We wanted to show you what we put together for you there as well, so you don't miss out. Uh, another couple of things we wanted to talk about <clears throat> is Zoom. A few of our clients asked the question, is Zoom safe? One thing that we have is we have an enterprise version of Zoom. So it patches a lot of the security links and holes that others might have. We've also taken some precautions, have a waiting room and other forms as well. And what we've done with Zoom is really made sure that it is safe for participation like this. Our next Zoom actually will go through our BoxCast. We want to be able to use all two or three different mediums that we might have here available for doing broadcasts. So uh, I wanted to bring at least to you some of these different items uh, up that I know that you've brought up to us. And I know I was talking recently with my mother-in-law for the, uh, we do a, we did a Easter call with our family and, and my wife's family. And she was hesitant, very, very, very hesitant because of what she'd heard about Zoom. So I wanted to address that piece with you right away as well. You saw last week also, we sent out a couple of different pieces. We sent out a family history gathering questionnaire. And what we looked at is you have more time than ever at home since we're all basically quarantined at home. We wanted to start offering a few different things that you might wanna to do to gather true wealth. So let me give you one big thing. We always begin in gratitude. One of our huge gratitudes for, for us, at least we've talked about this lately, is our ability to be home with our family, our ability to talk with people over Zoom that we haven't talked with in a long time, to reach out and connect, and almost have Thanksgiving or our, our Easter meal as if we had our Easter meals together without the travel. So if any of you had done that, it's one of the things we've set up weekly now is a weekly family Zoom call. So our gratitude is that this kind of technology exists and that we can still get together and feel like we're all together and see each other face to face over incredible technology such as this. They have their snafus, but just like us and just like you, they're adapting rapidly to getting the security from 10 million people starting on Zoom six weeks ago to over 100 million on Zoom today. So it's a, it's a big increase, but they weren't prepared for that kind of a 10 times increase in six weeks. At any rate, I wanted to go through that piece. But as we get back to the questionnaire on the family, what we all thought about and talked about is how beautiful it would be to find our ancestors who are no longer here telling us how they felt during items in times like this, during 1929, 1939. Um, see how it was when they maybe left their country and came across on a boat. The only thing we can do now is gather that information for us. So we gave you a questionnaire that for two things, one, it's for you to be able to answer the questions yourself for future children and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren you may never meet. And also take the oldest living uh, member of your family and ask some of these questions too. Some of them are tender questions. They may not want to answer them, but more data that you can get from them will add to your true wealth. So I wanted to say why we sent that one out. We also sent out a poem. I've done some poem writing, and a few of you have seen it before, called The Plaza in My Backyard. Um, and I just wanted to share that piece with you as well. And also we put our past webinars on the site as well. A couple of things we want to say, most of all, we hope that you're doing well. And we mean that with your health. So one thing we found from a lot of our experts, there's some basic things that you can do, which is to get enough sleep. Uh, it's extremely important because in the last hour of sleep, you actually get a good portion of your boost for, uh, for your immune system. So making sure you're getting plenty of sleep is a big part of staying healthy as well. Protect your mind. Protecting your mind is extremely important because people look at healthcare as only one thing, physical healthcare, vitamins, working out and all, but there's actually the other 50%, which is your mental health care. So it's very, very important. One of the book I'm reading now is a book of joy with uh, Dr. Desmond Tutu and uh, the Dalai Lama. And one of the things they say is, one of the most important things we need to work on is our mental or preparation for times like this. So as you look at it, 
if you look at our immunity, it's called mental immunity, not just physical immunity. So 50% of our equation is mental immunity. And how do we do that? <clears throat> Excuse me, by thinking good thoughts, by hanging around good people, by turning off the television and turning on the music. So at any rate, some of the different pieces that we're seeing as well. Um, some of what we did last week, let me just touch base on it. So on uh, Saturday, I was able to be on two different separate calls. One was with um, Ken Rakowski from a group called Metal in Hollywood. I meet them when I got to the Abundance 360 program, but I happened to be on a, a call with John Scully, the formal CEO of Apple, uh, also with Jim McAfee, who's a, basically a hiding fugitive now. He got him on the call from some undisclosed location. The interesting thing is to hear the opinions of these great people and what's going on as well. Also with Dr. Jordan Sling, he talked about the psychosomatic issues that go on when this happens about psychosomatic symptoms, feeling that any cough, any throat issue you have, any head, it all is going to be COVID. So one thing to be very careful, sometimes the symptoms actually come up from just thinking about it. I also was in a breakout. It was odd. So they got these, if you haven't been on a Zoom yet with, with breakouts, they had a Zoom breakout that had me get into a room with four others. One of them was Kenny Rogers, former um, agent. He also wrote the song, We Are the World. He managed a bunch of country stars. But it was really odd. I'm thinking, what am I doing in a room with this guy? And we talked for maybe five or six minutes. It was kind of fun. He said, there's a good special coming out on Kenny Rogers, if you want to see that, um, coming up here, celebrating his life, which he'll be in. He has crazy white hair. So if you're looking, that's him. And then after that, I was on a call with Tony Robbins, uh, Peter Diamandis, and with, uh, with um, Bob Hariri from Cellularity. The interesting thing about this call is they talked about the real crisis with COVID and that's fear. Fear being very, very strong. Many times more people die of fear than they do of, the, of diseases themselves. It was an interesting comment that they had made. They also came out with a, with a question that they brought up over a lot of the discussion is, at what point do we have more people pass away because of the unemployment that things are doing to the economy than the disease itself? Interesting point. Don't know if there's a, a great solution to that, but it was an interesting point to bring up as well. Um, most of the symptoms from most people getting COVID will be mild. They might even notice they have it. But of the 100 that actually feel they should go to the hospital, what they're finding is 80 or so will actually be released that day and not actually be admitted. 20 admitted in some form and four will go to the intensive care unit. So out of the thousands that have it, it's, it's a much smaller piece. But when it happens all at once is what we're seeing on television as well. Uh, some of the different pieces that were interesting was, um, was how many people are passing away from other items. So they said every single day, 3,200, Tony Robbins is saying this, 3,200 people die of car accidents. Yet we don't ban people from driving cars. We accept the risk. So it's a very interesting comment to say we've got two different sides here, but don't get me wrong. They think safety is important. They weren't critical of the government. They say we're all adapting. There's all new. This is stuff we're doing. But most importantly, we're preparing ourselves for the next one. It's a great opportunity for us to prepare for whatever the next crisis is in healthcare. Um, it was really interesting to hear about a lot of those opportunities and some of the hydroxy, uh, hydroxy uh, I think it's however they pronounce it, the piece that's basically a malaria drug. They found 100 doctors or so using it. There's some other therapies that are actually doing very well, but sometimes you're going to find some conflict with the data. Uh, but they found 100 doctors using those as well. But keeping your immune system is also very strong. And then Dr. Gladden just recently gave us a statement about it's actually they're finding it. It tears down the iron in our cells. So your blood cannot carry the oxygen and it breaks that bond so that we actually feel like we're suffocating. And then it also inflames the lungs. So it's not a pneumonia like issue. So we're learning a ton about it. The whole point is we're learning a ton about this. It's evolving. We're finding it very quickly. We're finding things that work not just on prevention but also on, uh, once we have it uh, itself. So interesting piece I just wanted to bring up to you as well. Um, one thing I wanted to say though, is the toughest job right now that exists out there is a bank security officer. Because everybody coming in looks like they want to rob it. So I thought that was a fairly interesting one as well. It's kind of a, kind of a neat one. So anyway, what I wanted to do with no further ado, you're going to have myself, you're going to have Ken, you're going to have Zach on the, this call. And what we're going to do is go through what we find as a, a presentation that gives us really uh, a base to work from for a lot of what we're doing as far as getting through this market. So I'll take you off now of the, uh, the food. But this is a good one I think a, a client had sent, uh, sent to us, which is it's the eighth day of isolation, and it feels like Vegas in my house. We're losing money by the minute. Cocktails are acceptable at any hour, and nobody knows what time it is. So if you feel that way, that could be the case as well. I might call it Groundhog Day, but I thought that was kind of an interesting one that you, uh, you may want to see as well. Um, as we begin with this, again, there's some more technical pieces, but I'll fall back on some of the people that we work with. You know, we look at uh, Nick Murray, we look at Howard Marks, we look at you know, the Warren Buffets, we look at, you know, basically historians, we follow five or six or seven, um, Brian Westbury, some of the economists, and we choose to follow them because historically they may not be, they're not trying to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, but they're giving us a good idea of what to do during these times. 
That's what we want to be to you. So in some of these seven key truths to being a successful stock investor, I'm going to go through them. You've heard them before. They're basically a lot of them who we are. But I wanted to show you these as kind of key fundamentals as before we start the technical part of the presentation. First of all, the first truth, stock markets declines are inevitable. They are, have a nature of ordinariness and evanescence. Basically, if you look at this summary in this way, so Nick is a very wordy, loquacious individual, but the advancement is permanent. The declines are temporary. That's how we view the market. So in the bigger picture, always fall back to that. There will be declines. We don't know what the new ones will be. This one is now named COVID, but there's going to be others in the future. Truth number two, since the end of World War II, there's been 14 bear markets and they've averaged 31% decline. The range you'll see here is between 19 and, and us, 57%. Therefore, if you exit the market when it officially enters a bear market territory, which means it's down 20%, on average, you're two thirds of the total decline already behind you. So that's where a lot of people say, oh my gosh, we're in a bear market. At that point, it's time to sit tight. It's time to sit tight, we believe, during the entire thing. But if people do freak out after it's a bear market, two thirds of the, of the worst part is typically behind them as well. So it's an interesting truth, number two. Truth number three, considering all bear markets since 1926, the average time from a bull market peak to a bear market break even is 3.3 years. So for instance, when it dropped to the point where it recovers, on average is 3.3 years, and the last five or so have actually been less than that as well. But this is a great truth as well. Another is history can prepare us by doing lifeboat drills. You've seen them do it with us. We put them in re your reviews as well, showing you what can happen at a 6% gain or a 20% decrease or a 10% decrease in your portfolio. We do that every year to prepare you for this. And I gotta have to say with Ken, myself, and Zach, your uh, behavior has been exceptional. You guys, it's showing you, you guys are becoming mature, phenomenal investors because the behavior you exhibit is actually uh, more of the fear missing out of putting money more, more money in when the market's down. So it's been great. You guys know the lifeboat drills. You've seen them before. For those of you who are new, you'll see more of these when markets are good. We talk about corrections all the time, even in good markets. Number five, getting the full return of equities is entirely predict predict or predicated on one's ability to ride out temporary declines. So using post-World War II history as a guide, you may expect your portfolio as a temporary setback on an average of 30%, one in every five years. So that's for equities. But just giving you an idea of what that means is, it's going to look great. Here's the long-term line, but you're going to have these massive setbacks over time. That's part of being an equity investor. That's one of Nick's truths as well. The sixth truth is there's only two ways to live your life as an equity investor, to live your life in fear that this time is different and it won't recover, or two, to live it in faith that this too shall pass. If history is any guide, number two is more likely the outcome. But one thing we know for sure is there are no future facts. Nobody knows. Truth number seven, try to, time, or to try to time a bear market is to ensure that one will end up worse than if one had just stayed the course. I've heard some people talk before about this and it's an interesting piece. You'll actually find that um, we've heard some people who the average person gets out might lose a certain percentage and all, we, we hear all that. But more importantly, I think what's important to know is you have to be right at least twice, getting out and getting in. And that's very hard to do. We'll talk about timing a little later on in the program, but we just wanna make sure these are seven of the key truths that we wanted to bring up to you in this as well. Uh, and the COVID crisis 19, this time is different, but the end game doesn't need to be. So that what it basically is, this is not an economic correction, it's become one, but it started as we talked about with a, with a crisis that's occurred from some pandemics. So our country survived pandemics in the past. So here's some of the data we've talked of. Polio, the late 40s and 50, we had 57,000 cases, 3,100 deaths, 21,000 disabilities, just as a sample in 1952. H2N2, which was the East Asia virus back in the 50s, if any of you remember that as well. Uh, and that would be the 1.1 million worldwide had it, 116,000 deaths in the United States. So these are things that we say, oh, this has never happened before. Strange enough, maybe not exactly, but you're finding something similar has occurred. 2009, the swine flu, that was during a big recession that we had as well. So that might've been covered up by the recession that we were having. So when we look at this, it, it has been something that's occurred before. And how did the past stock market survive through these pandemics? Well, here's a CPI, this is core inflation. So if you go to 1949, and this is probably before some of you were born, but maybe right around some of you, the CPI, just the price index was at 24. It's up about 11 times since then, just as of March 31st of last year. The S&P in 1949 was 15.3, and it was at March 31st, 2550, or 2585, up 168 times. So despite all those setbacks and pandemic, we've actually found that the market is up significantly over cost, which that's our goal. Growth alone is annualized at about 7.3% plus dividends during that period of time. So really an interesting piece to, to throw, just to kind of give you some base understanding of where we've been and where, we've been, where we're going. 
Uh, hard to tell you where we're going, obviously, there's no future facts, but wanted to show you where we've been in the past. Um, our nation's challenge, the goal is to save lives and with an underlying effort to minimize the economic uh, impact on livelihoods. That's really what's been going on. So how do you balance the two? We wanna minimize, obviously, the economic impact. We, we also wanna make sure we keep lives safe. So that's where this is a very, very important piece to overall, we believe. Now, the, this downturn may be severe, projected cost to gross domestic product. Just in travel and tourism and restaurants, 4.5%. I don't know about you, but I've been to a couple of restaurants to try to support our local, um, local network here in the community. And I have found at least the Mequon Pizza Company, River Club, and then Highland House, three around here, have been wildly busy when it comes pickup time. So hopefully that's been very good for them, keeps them alive and floating. But we support, we encourage you to support your local restaurant and businesses if you can as well that are remaining open, um, available. So also business and real estate investments might add 3% to it. Durable good purchases, autos, furniture, and electronics down 2%. So what's interesting here, if you want to know what's, what's most, to talk about the, these trying times, what's most? purchased right now on Amazon, sold out right now, Jenga. That's that little game we're used to stack things. Jenga sold out, finger paints are some of the best sellers. What you're noticing is most of the best sellers are things to keep children occupied when they're at home. Interesting that our schools have now become our homes for children, which is pretty interesting as well. What you've also found is a very large pickup in crossbows. Um, I don't know if that's because you can't buy guns over the internet maybe, but so it's been more about crossbows as well. The second one is classic car sales have been up significantly, because I think men love to have something they can work on. And then also the tools that are working on those classic cars have gone up as well. So prices on some of those have skyrocketed as well. So for those of you who collect classic cars who want to sell them, maybe a good market if you're trying to buy one, you're going to pay a little more. Uh, but if you look at this, this could be a 10% hit to the, to the economy. Um, when you look at the past economic contractions, this is really looking at the Great Depression. It's a 26% decline. A five and, and you know, the last couple of you've seen have been a five and maybe in this case here, a percent uh, decline in the re is recession. This could be bigger. We've stopped most things that aren't essential and you're gonna find a significant key. Now the key is how do we start the, the economy on the other side once we get past the, uh, the severity and making sure we're saving lives and being careful now. So it's an interesting piece to look at, but looking at history, you can see the Great Depression was a massive, basically a quarter cut to the economy at the time where other people might say the whole economy went away, it dropped 90%, well, it didn't, it dropped 26% during that time as well. Welcome everyone. I, uh, as you guys can tell, and uh, hopefully can see me, I am not at the office, um, but uh, you notice I was not on the webinar either last week, but that's just because I live um, downtown, a little bit higher risk area, and just with everything going on, I uh, just really wanted to be as safe as possible for um, clients first and also all the families of all of our coworkers. So I'm very grateful for uh, technology that this is possible, that I'm here with you guys and work-wise um, that with the team that we can use Zoom, communicate and with phones. So I'm grateful to be here and honored and humbled to be here in front of you as well. Um, the biggest thing that we're gonna look at moving forward here is just a little bit of perspective and guidance from both the Great Depression and also the Great Recession in 2008-2009. Uh, so we're gonna compare those two. You guys know I love fundamentals. And so some people often have asked us, uh, what does it mean by depression? What is uh, the definition of depression? There isn't necessarily a set answer, uh, but it's a period of economic recessions that extend over a period of time with significant decline in income and unemployment. So that's the, the most accepted definition of what depression is. If we looked at the Great Depression on the slide here uh, from 1929 to 1933, um, the different causes that went into that. Now this was, there's many causes, but these were a couple that we pulled out and took a look at. Um, inflated stock and real estate prices, excessive leverage and margins on assets. We were just beginning to really learn and understand uh, markets, our banking, and the magnitude of it. Uh, no bank guarantees on deposits. No Fed or congressional intervention to stimulate the economy. And now the results that that had, we had a GDP decline of 27%, 26.7, uh, unemployment at 20 plus percent, and deflation at almost 30%. And one of the biggest issues during that time that we heard from clients, both their parents, grandparents, and people 
that have gone through it at that time was pessimism and loss of confidence in our systems and our economy. If we take a look at the Great Recession, kind of putting it side by side cause and result there as well. Uh, recession, if we're going back to the fundamentals, we've been asked of what is a recession? What is the definition of recession? And that is two quarters of negative GDP growth. So when we say recession or you hear it on the news, and it's also part of a normal business cycle. When we hear it on the news, when we hear it um, in other forms from the media, we think of that oftentimes as a major negative, which definitely is, is not a good thing, but it's also normal and part of the normal business cycle. If we're looking at 2007 and 2009, just as a little bit of perspective, a cause was financial deregulation, an inflated real estate bubble, subprime mortgages and shadow banking, excessive leverage and derivatives, uh, systematic breaches in accountability and accounting. And the result of those was a GDP decline of 5.1%, unemployment of 10%, and uh, deflation as none. So just trying to bring a little perspective, guidance, and history into this is by no means um, lowering the impact of what COVID means to us now, but we love history. Uh, Chris, Ken, and myself, and the entire team and try to bring it to you whenever we can. Thank you, And if we're looking at just a side by side again of just some fiscal monetary policies between the Great Recession and Great Depression, the monetary policies, interest rates dropped, liquidity increased. And as far as fiscal policies, which some of those that we're seeing now, even with COVID-19, is government spending being increased and taxes being decreased. Trying to ease some of the pain during those. Absolutely. And then uh, just the Fed chairman, Ben Bernanke, he was... Uh, the Fed chairman in 2008 during the, the Great Recession, and he took a lot of learning that our country saw during the Depression and was steadfast in working with Congress to not make the same mistakes. Ben Bernanke took over from Alan Greenspan in 2006, and um, he brought in a lot of newer policies that we learned from the Great Depression and other times throughout history, and one of those was enacting a low-rate policy to stabilize the economy, and we're kind of seeing uh, similar things now as well. So it'll be really interesting to see what we pull from COVID-19 and hopefully what uh, our government, our country, and each of us individually learn from it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Absolutely. So this is an interesting one. Day two without sports. Found a lady sitting on my couch. Apparently she's my wife. She seemed nice. So to some of the sports ad addicts out there, you might identify with this as well. It's kind of a funny piece, but we, uh, we think that's uh, something we wanted to share. Yeah, so what we're going to do now, hello everybody, uh, good morning, it's, it's good to be on, a, if you're on the call and you're on the Zoom call, it's, it's great to have you with us. I am in the office, uh, unlike Zach said, uh, but uh, I get a break coming to the office, having the four kids at home, uh, my wife is doing a fantastic job with the homeschooling, there's a lot going on, a lot of moving pieces at home right now, so I have a new love and appreciation for you teachers out there, so if you're an educator in your life and you're on the call, I thank you. When we can go back to hugging each other, I want to give you a hug next time I see you because I have a new love and appreciation for all of you. So, um, uh, But what we're going to go through here is uh, the bear markets of the 1930s, 70s, and the 2000s. We're going to take a trip down memory lane right now. So we talk about the Great Depression time frame. Uh, a lot of us know people, our, our parents, our grandparents who, who grew up during this time frame. Uh, and it was a very challenging time. I'll ask my grandmother about, you know, what was it like growing up during the Depression time frame? And she said, Kenny, if we had a piece of bread and lard, that was a good day. And the, the, those are not the choices we all make today. It's, it's wildly different than that. So having just an appreciation of where people have come from, how that, is, how that has affected them over the course of their life is, is a major thing. But we look at the investor fears during the 1930s. Depression was, a, it was one of them. Double dip recession, war in Europe. I mean, World War II was, was starting up at that point in time. And also, Zach mentioned deflation, the price of things actually going down rather than up. And, and that's, that's quite opposite of the 80s that we saw as well. So, um, so yeah, those were some of the investor fears during the 1930s at that point in time. If we look at the numbers, what happened for, for that decade, from January 1 of 1930 to December of 1939, you can see the S&P 500 was flat. It was down just a touch, but for the most part, flat. 
long-term government bonds, that's 10-year, 15, 30-year bonds that the government's issue that pass interest each and every year, we're up 4.88%. Um, and the U.S. Treasury bills, U.S. Treasury bills are short-term type of government bonds, short-term meaning a year or less, sometimes three months, sometimes six months. Um, and that was actually 0.55% at that point in time. Uh, short-term interest rates, not very high either. Um, we were at, you know, one and a half percent during that time frame. Annual inflation rate was actually negative. That was a deflation that Zach mentioned before and, and caught and prices actually going down. Unemployment rate skyrocketed 18.3 percent, almost 20 percent unemployment rate. We don't know exactly you know, where the unemployment rate is right now, but we know it, it could reach double digits through all this. So, but during the, the depression time frame, it was almost 20 percent. What's interesting about this as well, Ken, I think Ken brought this up earlier when we were talking beforehand, is that this is the first period, there's two periods in history where we've had a, a negative return for 10 years on the S&P, you'll see that. That was one in the 1930s in the Great Depression, and you'll see one coming up as well when we show that as well. And look at this, short-term interest rates were three times what longer-term interest rates were. Really, very odd time, very odd time. We go through the 1970s. That was a trying time for for a lot of us. That you you've told stories about, you know, wage and price freezes, Watergate scandal that happened with uh, with Nixon, which led to the Nixon resign, uh, which is the fourth point. The oil embargo, the OPEC oil crisis. I've heard stories from you that you were lined up down the street, uh, trying to get gas, and if you had an even number, that was your day, and if you had an odd number, that was that was another day. Um, those are trying times as you look in the back seat, having two kids back there, wondering if you're going to get gas for the day. Um, again, a lot of us haven't been through through that that type of pain or those types of decisions we need to make at that point in time. But these were the investor fears during the 1970s, a very trying time. Um, escalation of the, the controversial Vietnam War um, what was there, New York City almost near bankruptcy. Three Mile Island disaster, where that was a nuclear reactor number two in Pennsylvania that happened. And, um, you know, that was the first kind of bout with, um, you know, with uh, the whole nuclear type of uh, situation where it could, it could, could do bodily harm for all us. Hyperinflation, things were getting more expensive, actually wildly more expensive. This is that actually led into part of the 80s. A lot of you remember your first mortgage rate. Uh, you know, that wasn't necessarily in the 70s, but that was definitely in the start of the 80s where um, a lot of you told me that your first mortgage rate was 10, 12, potentially even 14% at that point in time. Again, times are wildly different than they were back in the 70s and 80s, just 30, 40 years ago, times of, are, are much different. You look at the, the, the 10 years, the decade at a glance, if you will, for the 70s, the S&P 500 up 5.86%. So a very trying time, you had a positive market, which was nice to see. Long-term government bonds, again, the longer type of uh, interest rates that the government will pay you if you own a bond is 5.51. Interestingly enough on this one, U.S. Treasury bills, which are the short-term notes, like I mentioned before, 6.31. That's called the inverted yield curve. So a lot of you have heard that before. What does that mean? That means that when U.S. Treasury bills and short-term rates pay more than what the long-term rates pay. That's called an inverted yield curve. Saw that back in the 70s. We saw back in 2019, just last year in our lives, we saw an inverted yield curve as well. Some say that's an indicator of a recession coming through. Uh, you know, this one's hard to tell if it was a if it was an indicator or not because of the COVID-19, which which uh, which put us into a recession. Um, but we don't know if that would happen or not. But some say that is a is a leading indicator, if you will. Short term interest rates, all time highs, eight uh, percent at that point in time. I mentioned your mortgage was eight percent, ten percent. But but the interest rates we could put in the bank and the CDs were also eight percent as well. Um, those were the days some, some of you have told me. <laughs> uh, annual inflation rate, again, uh, doubled in what most, uh, you know, if you look at the average of the inflation rate, doubled 7.37%. Unemployment rate, not too bad at 6.21%. So a tough time, but a lot more people working than, than not at that point in time. So mm -hmm. some people say 4 or 5% is full unemployment. Um, just because of um, the, the, there's, there's a percentage of the population that, um, that, that, just, that just doesn't work. Um, we see the 2000s, the world's greatest generation, the millennium. Um, some people, you, I've talked to you, you have mixed feelings about these people. Some people, <laughs> very, very, very interesting type of uh, generation. Uh, very hard working, uh, but sometimes have a different outlook on things as well. Investor fears during the 2000s, dot com bubble. Everybody mentioned, everybody remember Y2K? Mm -hmm. Everybody thought the world was gonna come to an end? Um, and that, that was a very legit thing if you talk to some of the programmers out there. Um, making that change to, to, to the 2000s was actually a thing. 
Um, but, but again, Y2K, we're all here today to talk about it, which was nice. Um, some of us were at church at that point in time. <laughs> September 11th, terrorist attacks, very serious. Two of the World Trade Centers came down. Two of the most iconic, most powerful buildings in the world came down at that point in time. Yet we're here to talk about it. So, some people talk about you know, what's going to change our lives out of all this when we get through the coronavirus and what's going to change. Um, it's hard to say. It's hard to say when we go places. Are we going to have our temperature taken? Uh, I've heard the government talking about having actual cards that we have to show if we've been affected by coronavirus. One thing I have to say here, I heard someone say this before, is no one thought that we'd have to go through an x-ray machine to actually be on a plane and fly around the world. Um, now that's become our part of our daily life. Um, where we, we go, we go through the X-ray machine and, and hold our hands up. 2003 Iraq War, um, you know, kind of, kind of in response to the, to the 9/11 attacks, if you will. Saddam Hussein, Enron, WorldCom, Arthur Anderson, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns. The list could go on here with companies that we thought were very, very strong. Um, and, and believe it or not, some of these uh, actually went bankrupt. So you never know. Um, it's, it was interesting to see what the government did and who they backed. They backed the banks. And they let investment companies um, kind of go by the wayside because of the mortgage-backed securities, all the derivatives, the highly leveraged types of products that are out there that came through. The 2008 housing bubble, uh, we all know what happened there. We call those the ninja loans. Some people said the ninja, no income, no job, and you all of a sudden you get a, 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 a loan out of it and they get a nice house out of it. Um, that, that has gone by the wayside as well. But now all of a sudden Dodd-Frank came along and said, hey, let's put some restrictions on lending. Um, some people call it Graham Dodd, but we, so most people call it Dodd Frank. <laughs> uh, but again, that was that was a Wall Street reform and Consumer Protection Act to make sure those ninja loans weren't necessarily happening. People had, you know, resources and assets and, and great paying jobs behind them to own a home um, and, and some of those bigger homes that we've seen. So that was the investor fears during 2000. A lot going on at that point in time. And here's what we saw. Chris mentioned this one. When we looked through that decade, we actually saw the S&P 500 be flat or slightly negative during that time frame. These are one of the two periods that we've seen, the 30s and the, in the 2000s. Uh, Long-term government bonds paid off handsomely. And that's the point of a diversified portfolio. Sometimes our stocks don't carry, carry us, but the bonds will. 7.69. U.S. Treasury bills more back into that normal year, yield curve where short-term rates pay a little less than long-term rates. If we, if we put our money in something that's longer term, we should get paid more for that uh, in short term. So back to more of a normal yield, yield curve at that point in time. Short-term interest rates, 5.96, 6%. Annual inflation right around the average, around 2.5, 3%. Um, that was good. Again, unemployment rate very, very uh, at a normal rate at that point in time. So um, recently it was at three and a half, four percent, but now with COVID, there's a lot of families, uh, you know, that have been affected financially from that. And, uh, and we say a prayer for all this. It's very inspiring. This is off the note, but it's, it's very inspiring to listen to some of our clients talk. Um, I talked to a great couple yesterday, uh, doing very well, uh, able to work from home, able to keep their positions, but they actually want to help out their families right now. And um, it's, it's a challenging thing because you don't want to come across the wrong way saying, oh, look at us. But you know what? We're, we're family. We're, we're the Gentian family. Uh, you look at our own families, and we want to help each other out, and that's the whole point. It's, it's amazing to see people rise up during this time frame, and that was just a great, inspiring story I heard yesterday from a great client. So that was a decade at a glance for, for, the, for the 2000s. Sorry to jump around there, but things sometimes pop in. So, Key, key, number t key takeaway number one, a broadly diversified portfolio of quality stocks and bonds has helped to mitigate the risk over the long term. This is what we just talked about. There's times where our stocks lead the way and really give us that rate of return we need. Longer term, that's what stocks do. Bonds, when we go through a tougher time in the market, they give us income. They also give us stability. Um, they also give us the rate of return that we're looking for for, this, for that as well. So if you look at right now during the markets, our bonds are holding up very nicely right now. Your bonds that you own right now in your portfolio holding up very, very nicely. So one thing I want to do for Ken, thank you, Ken, is jump back on an idea that he had. So here's the case. You're all very abundant. We've been blessed. Many of you would agree with that as well. Maybe take that as an opportunity to reach out to somebody you know who may be having a rough time. Offer them something. If they have a tough time accepting it ego-wise, then maybe do it anonymously. But I think using some of that abundance that you haven't been blessed with right now, because we've talked to a lot of you as well, and you're not spending it. You're actually finding money piling up in the portfolio. Look towards a cause or maybe somebody or somebody in the family who's been affected by it pretty heavily and maybe offer something to them. So I think it's a great point Ken brings up and it's something we've been talking to a lot of you about. So we listen very carefully when we're, when we're reaching out and talking to you as well. So thanks for sharing those stories, Ken, both and clients as well alike. 
So as we get through some of what people worry about in the, in the Great Depression, in the Great Recession in the 70s, we want to get to a funny one here. This, you know, they said to wear a mask now and gloves when you went out to the grocery store. So I did, but they lied because everyone else had clothes on. It's kind of fun when there's actually no response. Like I can hear you laugh in a seminar, but at that one, that one's pretty funny. <laughs> so as you go through, we like to break it up a little bit of brevity and humor. This is one piece. This is a piece that we looked up and I think Peter found this graph, but it's something that's very, very important. I wanted to touch base on. If you look at this during times that are very important, there's one of those graphs, it's a five-star graph. Insiders are measured here by this yellow line. And when insiders are buying, you're gonna see that as a higher number here. Than, uh, than people who aren't inside a company buying. And why is that important? You see they spiked here, they spiked here in 2011, they spiked here as well. These almost all coincide with massive corrections when the average person was selling, the insider in the company was buying because what's happening, or the company was buying itself back, its stock back as well because they knew what the future held for it in their company. When stocks got to be some of the lowest prices in history in the 2011s, um, also they were buying back then as well. And you'll see the massive spike in their purchasing right now as well. Now, is that an indicator of exactly what will happen? No. But historically, we're right now at a point that's very close to where we were at the bottom of the market in 2009 as far as insider uh, uh, purchasing, outpacing uh, selling. So at any rate, uh, you'll see that that's a very interesting piece here. Insiders typically have a big concentration in their stock. They have to sell it off to make money. Uh, and in living over time, that's where the compensation is made. When you see these spikes, sometimes they correspond with an issue that... Um, we might find interesting. So we found this one to be a very, very good piece. And it came from the, the Washington service as well. So anyway, I wanted to just share that one with you too. This one as well. It's interesting because in our portfolio, we have both growth and value. And Ken's gonna talk a little bit more about um, uh, rebalancing in a bit. But if you look at this, this chart goes back to 1997. When you look at this chart, it's extremely important to see growth and value perform almost opposite. We've shown you these charts over time. Back in 2000, you'll find that value was really, really in the Y2K and dot-com time. Value was very much underappreciated. Growth was flying, if you will. Um, so you saw they really were at a strong disparity between the two. And then you'll find value recovered during the downtime. People realized that's buying things on sale is actually a good idea. And for about 10 years, you found that there was a massive increase in value stocks, stocks that were low prices and, and they were on sale, if you will, that had been forgotten in the, in the massive tech run. You saw growth stocks really kind of diminish but then you saw this very interesting point around 06, 07, 08, right around the Great Recession, where growth stocks recovered and started taking a massive, massive lead over value stocks. So if you look at that as a 4-2 anyway, look at the growth and value difference here. It's about as high as we've ever seen it. So what does that mean? That means rebalancing is extremely important, but it's an interesting point to take a look at as well. It's not saying that growth is going to stop, because when I talked to a couple of Nobel Prize winners on this, they've actually said that, how long can this last? And I got a great data scientist out of... Um, uh, University of Chicago said, well, it could be 25, 30 years. And I go, are you serious? He said, well, probably 15 or so. But when you look at it, this can remain dispersed like this for a very long time, but they will come back towards median at some point. So we thought that was another important one to show you as well. And this is, we get a ton of this technical stuff. This is what we get. This is what we do. We read tons of graphs and charts. There's 93 charts we get from JP Morgan every quarter, every month, I should say. We get charts from all over. The key for us right now is we get FOMO, fear of missing out on some great piece of information, some this and that. So for us, we gotta protect our minds as well. Fear of missing out when the market was dropping. Oh, we should have sold, right? Fear of mar missing out when the market goes up. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna miss out on some of these buys. Watch how closely on really good days, investors' mindsets shift from, oh my gosh, I'm gonna lose everything to, oh my gosh, I'm gonna miss out on the upside. It's impressive, but fear of missing out occurs in two directions. So it's something we've seen as well. Yeah, that's a perfect lead in, Chris. Really appreciate that of understanding investors' emotions. As, uh, as you guys either know me or get to know me, I absolutely love the psychology of, of how we think, how we, how we act, why we do, and especially when it relates to uh, financial planning, our finances in general. And we have a, uh, a few things to go through with you here as well. First question, are investors irrational? And so if we're looking at a, at a business cycle or just in general of markets either being up or on its way down and um, point of maximum financial risk, you'll see on the left how most investors feel is the thrill, the excitement, the euphoria. And that's actually the, the time where if we go down uh, this, this cycle, 
you know, the denial of fear, desperation, panic, that's the point of maximum financial opportunity when it's the, actually the exact opposite of what the media tells us and how we naturally feel when we see this and when we react to it. And the, the biggest thing that we try to provide for you is to make sure that we don't react during these times and that we respond because these feelings that you feel when they go through here, they're completely normal. It's what you should feel. Uh, but for your long-term plan, that's where we come in and say, this is actually a maximum financial opportunity for you if we respond properly. And Zach, you want to know what's interesting on this as well, and, and for you on the call, uh, can myself and Zach feel this? So what I've been very close, I've got a very, very high emotional EQ, or I, I really practice my um, emotional intelligence and feeling it. We can feel when this is going on. Now, you can typically go back and then recognize it later. But look at these anxiety, denial, fear, desperation, panic. We can see despondency, depression, hope. When does that start? So when markets get to a bottom, think that people think they're never going to get better. They're never going to get better, but we start to see hope. And we start to see relief rallies. And we start to see optimism again. You know, when you look at it, it's a very interesting piece, but we can actually feel each portion during phone calls with you, during our meetings with you. So it's an interesting piece for us. It's a great graph that illustrates it's a, it's a, it, it continues. It's a cycle that continues. And uh, when, when Chris mentioned hope, it made me think of a, a quote that I recently read, and it's the, the only thing more contagious than a virus is hope. So I figured that was extremely applicable. That's by Admiral William McRaven. Uh, he was in charge of the Navy SEALs, loved the Navy SEALs as well. But the only thing more contagious than a virus is hope. Uh, continuing on, investor return is a combination of both investor behavior and performance of the investment. And the investment behavior is, is uh, the responsibility in our role of you and also of us to guide through those times, through those feelings of, are we going to be okay? Are we still on plan? Is this part of our, is our finances in the right hands? And then the, also the other side is the performance of the investment. We take a lot of time behind the scenes on a, a quarterly, a monthly, a weekly basis to make sure that the funds we have are uh, responding properly with their peers, uh, with the markets in general. And we can talk a little later, and I can even maybe even run a, a fundamentals on how we choose uh, those for um, our investment portfolio and why we have them. Uh, but it's a combination of both. And the biggest one of those is, as you'll see in some charts from Chris and Ken later, is the behavior side. And chasing the investment, um, many of you know this, but it's always something that we're constantly reminded of during times like these and also uh, when markets are on an upward trend is history shows that investors who constantly change lanes to the year's hottest investments don't keep up with next year's overall average returns. If we look at a chart and look at what did best for the last month and then try to get in that investment at that time, it's already too late. That's why we stick with that diversified portfolio. If you go back to what Chris mentioned about growth and value, if you look at that, we should be putting everything, if we're, changing the, if we're chasing the hot investment, we should be going all in on growth. And that looks great when you look at the past, but that may not be what happens moving forward. That's exactly right. And the past economic sediment, this is just a, a really interesting one as far as perspectives. In the, in the red, you have a um, percentage of those who say economic conditions in the country are bad, and those of us who say they're good. And um, if we're just looking at this uh, during 2007, um, all the way through 2016, uh, we had more of a negative view than a positive view. And then over the last three years, uh, could be potentially what we were fed media-wise or the, the major uptick at first um, of the beginning of the most recent administration that, the, that it kind of flipped. So it'd be really interesting to see after um, COVID-19 based off of government responses and how our uh, nation as individuals and as an economy recover, how this is portrayed moving forward as well. And as a result of the financial crisis in 2008 and subsequent Great Recession, many investors are more concerned with playing it safe and clinging to the money they already have than growing it. And this goes back into uh, that investor behavior, those natural feelings. Um, those feelings, if you have those, are completely natural, uh, but that's where our role, our guidance, our experience as a team, um, with Chris being through 
uh, those worst 10 years that we showed on the, on the part and our plans prepared for those situations moving forward. Um, that's where our guidance, our role and our perspective come in for you. Thank you, Zach. So just a little bit now of history of the S&P. You've seen this chart before, but this almost illustrates the time that I came into this business in 1996. I came in in 1995. But well, what's really interesting in looking at this, so we had four or five years of absolutely looking brilliant. Anything you could do, there was no wrong. There was a slight downturn in 2008 or 1998, but an incredible run here, 106%. I mean, we felt you could, put, you could throw an arrow at anything. Oh my gosh, Microsoft, Dell, whatever. You're throwing arrows at it, right? And then all of a sudden you had a very, very significant uh, correction and it's a bear market. You saw that pretty significantly from 2000 in the, in the dot-com burst and the PE being 27, price to earnings ratio being 27.2, very, very high for the Ford PE to then hitting a, a, a downside really back in 2002 in October where you found the PE Ford PE being about 14. So it corrected significantly, a 50% move in the market over three years. And there were other events in there as well. And then we had a wonderful recovery again to 2007. The forward P wasn't that high that we had recovered with earnings, 15.7, right? But then we felt this low again in the economic, and I guess I call it an accounting change turn, if you will. The beautiful thing about this is from that accounting change, from that recession, each one of these has set a time frame. This was a secular bear market. This entire period here when we showed you was a secular bear. And now a secular bull market you'll find begins to take off on a lot of the internet technologies like the Netflix, the when you look at the basically Google, uh, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, these are all internet based in many cases and they have massive growth because of that and we're seeing that now as well. So seeing that going through now, the, the forward price to earnings ratio as of March 13th was only 15.4. So you found we weren't massively out of line. So in 2000, it was 27, 15, uh, if you will, back in, in 2007. At the peak, at the peak of 2019, we we're at 19.0 and then just at the end of last month at about 15.4 again. So you'll see, are we expensive? Were we expensive? Probably not. The dividend yield has gone up this entire time as well. So companies are paying us more money. But here's what's interesting in Ken's point, the 10 year treasury, look at treasuries. In the 2000s, they were 6%. Today they're at 0.7. So the 10 year treasury is at 0.7. It's really hard to, to believe that you're gonna get a great 10 year return of 0.7% that you'll accept that. Anyway, interesting to take a look at this 1996 through 2020. Um, we'll update this chart. I'm sure they're measuring my career and that's why they put this together. Uh, but no, I'm just joking. It's just an interesting 20 year period to take a look at for the S&P. But this is probably the most important part of it. So if you look at this chart as well in comparison, as I go through this, if you look at, this is 2003 on the far right side of this chart. The far left side of this is 2019. You might have to get closer to your screen to see this as well. But when you look at this, this is showing you when it's a positive number and money's flowing in to US equities it's showing a black number. When money is flowing out of US equities, it's showing a red number. This is US world taxable bond, tax-free bonds, and then liquidity is basically money markets. So here's, here's what's interesting. In 2003, you can see there was money in 2004, five and six, really flowing into mutual funds. Bonds are, were probably had just a tiny bit of flow, tax-free bonds a little bit here, but you started to see right around 2007 or so, people start to put a lot of money into bonds. What's interesting here is, from 2009, we started the best bull run we've seen in most of our lifetime so far, except for you who lived from 1980 to 2000. That was one of the best in history. But look at this, look what's happened. This negative number here, negative, negative. We've actually seen during the biggest bull run in the market, net outflows to stock during one of the biggest bull runs that exist. Where'd the money go? It went into bonds during one of their worst performing periods here. Kind of an interesting piece to see during one of the roughest periods in bonds, people were seeking the safety of bonds and also that of money market during really big downturns. So you'll find huge increases in money markets back in 07, 08, obviously. You've seen the same thing in 19. It'll be interesting to see the year to date as well. You saw a massive, massive increase in money going from bonds, from stocks and from gold into short-term safe assets. But here's the case. So cumulative flows of money into bonds since 2007 are illustrated in this graph here an incredible flow of people doing exactly the opposite of what will give them a great return when you're finding that the cumulative inflow to stocks has been massively, massively less. So what's interesting to take a look at, this is flows into US equities versus the S&P's performance. So if you start to look at this, the S&P here is in the yellow. At the same time that's happening, look at what people have been doing. The average person has been actually taking money out of ETFs and mutual funds and putting them into uh, bond uh, mutual funds and ETFs. What's interesting is what makes a difference. Companies have been buying back their stock. 
So there's still demand for it, but companies realize how much of a value their stock is and they've been buying it. Uh, and so reducing the float that's out there. So anyway, very interesting piece to see. We, we don't always show you this data because it's pretty, um, pretty uh, detail oriented, but very, very important, I think, for you to see the actual data behind what we say. People are actually selling stocks when they're doing well. So you're gonna find that's a, a really kind of a, a big issue that we see. You'll see that down here. This is domestic mutual fund flows in billions since 2007 have gone down significantly here as well. So you're gonna see here about of the, of the investors would do $1.9 trillion from equity mutual funds between 07 to 2019 during one of the best periods of return. The S&P's return from 09 till now is about 482% from the bottom of that correction until today. So it doesn't make any sense, does it? But again, this is what people do. This is what we have to combat. This is why we work very hard on best behavior, why we're always learning, teaching, reading, because this too shall pass, but this error has also happened before. We understand it. So we want to prevent that from happening to you, our clients, who, who trust us for that advice. Uh, where did the assets go? They flew out of domestic mutual funds. They flew into domestic bond funds. So stock funds basically sold and went to bond funds. So if you look at this, if today I think the 30-year treasury is in the one point something percent range, 1 1.2, 1.3. So are you going to accept 30-year return of 1.2%? I doubt many of you would say yes especially when maybe the yield on the, some of the different indexes today might be a couple of a percent. So you just got to take a look at history and see where things have, have gone. Missing out on the rally. So the stock market last year was up 31%, while taxable bond for funds did have a positive return, of but 8.7% in the same year. So you're looking at a tale of two cities. Now you do have the corrections, but this is just looking at last year's of people pulling out um, $92 billion in stocks to put it $415 billion into bonds just last year alone during one of the peak years in history. So looking at that, you don't know when those years will be, you gotta stay in. So this one here is probably the average investor. If you look at this chart, it's showing you REITs, gold, S&P, bonds, oil, EFA, which is foreign, homes and inflation, all their 20 year annualized returns by asset class. So if somebody wants to go, oh no, homes have returned a whole bunch. Well, they've been 3.4, they beat inflation, uh, but they've also, everything here, even inflation has beat the average investor because they typically wanna sell low and buy high, exactly opposite of what we should do by their own behavior. So you'll find over time, you're gonna say they majorly outperformed asset classes pretty significantly just because of their own behavior by about 4% from stocks. Uh, it's a very interesting period of time to see them. Yeah, and I'll have Mark yeah market time. So. We've heard we, we've heard a few things about market timers, and we've heard about the results of market timing. And uh, you know, do, fin do financial professionals have a better way? Well, we certainly we certainly do every single day here. Is we think about is there a better way than what we're doing right now? Mm -hmm. And we've yet to come up with a solid and concrete answer to say yes, there is a better way. Well, the, the results do speak for themselves of our retirees. Um, you know, you look at the experience with timers and hedge fund managers. I think, Chris, you were going to mention something here before. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, we've been looking since the beginning. So my former business partner, myself, a bunch of the study groups I've been, we've been looking. And some people believe in some timing. But when I look at the true results of timing over time, they sound brilliant if they make a sell before the market corrects or if they make a buy, you know, just when it's going up. Um, but rarely do those two things coincide. So we can't, that's great. That sounds awesome. Show me the proof. And we have yet to find somebody who will actually then send us the proof of it actually happening. Um, hedge funds as well, very, very intelligent people. I know some of them, I know a couple of hedge fund managers, brilliant, brilliant people. But on average, hedge funds are three, three times more expensive, you'll find oftentimes, and they give us about a 3% lower return. So we, we've seen them, we look at them, we still don't have that device. If we find somebody who finds a perfect device for timing, first of all, we're going to be very skeptical, but we're going to want to see track record of a very long uh, period of time during both good and good and bad markets to uh, be able to use that. But Ken, you got a great point. We have just not seen anybody deliver on timing. It's even in short periods or long periods of time. So it's just a very, very, very difficult thing to see. So that's, that's at least our historical belief on the, on the timers and hedge funds. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, when you, we talk about Warren Buffett, um, we talk about hedge funds. It's, fu it's funny. I'm wearing my heart Warren Buffett tags. I think there's a couple, <laughs> there's a couple of quotes coming up from Warren Buffett. So whenever I see that in a presentation, I wear my Warren Buffett tags. So I don't know if, if anybody has been to a Berkshire Hathaway, if, if you haven't, you know, I suggest that you're, I recommend that you, you may go. I mean, Warren Buffett is late eighties, I think 89 right now. So, um, it's a very interesting place to be. It's a very self-fulfilling thing because you go to a Berkshire Hathaway conference 
you hear from Charlie Munger, you hear from Warren Buffett, and then you walk around, you know, when they're not talking and you buy all their stuff that they own. <laughs> you, you, you buy the Brook shoes, you, you buy the Seas candy, uh, Duracell batteries. I mean, everything, you know, Heinz ketchup, they give away ketchup and stuff like that. So it's kind of funny uh, to go, but uh, it's really interesting to see what Warren Buffett did. Many years ago, um, Warren Buffett made a bet with the hedge fund managers out there. So there was hedge fund A, B, and C, and I think even D. Um, and what he did is he made a bet. I think it was a million dollars or 10 million. I can't remember the exact wager, but whoever won the bet over, um, I think it was a 10 year period versus a broadly diversified portfolio versus a hedge fund manager. And it was funny. And, and so they, they were tracking this and the overall portfolio, uh, broadly diversified portfolio beat the snot out of these hedge fund managers that are out there that, that, that think they can time the market and be better than that. And it's funny. I mean, I know people want to be part of an exclusive club. I understand that. I think there's, there's some, there's some magic to that for some people, uh, but the results just aren't there. And, and we've studied this. We understand it very well. Um, it's just interesting to see that, uh, that those hedge fund managers had to make a donation to Warren Buffett's charity because uh, he beat them. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So, that's what we've seen there on, on hedge fund managers. Price of panic. I'm going to move my, I got to move something here. The price of panic. You take a look at this piece and it goes through time and I have to find a better place to put my, there we go. Um, if you take a look at through time, initial investment of $10,000 market drops are more, more than 30% are, are, are indicated by those red buttons. That's not the easy button, by the way. That is the, uh, that's the red panic button there. So equity investors, you look through time, you look through the 80s. I remember Time Magazine in like it was 79 or 80, the stock market is dead. And all of a sudden we went on a 20 year bull run in the, in, the late, in the late 80s and the 90s. A lot of you remember that. A lot of you started investing money at that point in time. You know, 401ks came out in the late 70s and, and companies started offering these and we started putting money away and it was a great experience. Um, you know, having a great experience early on when you're investing is, is some, somewhat of the key to it. I can understand why some of the newer investors, some of the millennials have a hard time with it because if you started investing money back in 2006, seven and eight, and all of a sudden you went through a 2009, that doesn't give you a lot of confidence when you put $10,000 in there and next thing you look at it's around six. That doesn't give you a lot of confidence. So if, if there's not a lot of teaching going on, if there's not a lot of guidance going on from parents or, or financial advisors that are out there, um, I can see how that would be a very tough time. But what this is showing is that if you, go, if you look at an equity investor, someone who stayed the course the entire time ends up far better than, than really anybody else. I mean, that's really what this, this is saying. So you look at a $10,000 investment back in 1969, the end of 1969, the beginning of 1970, and you, see, you can see that an equity investor by far does the best. I don't know if that's a surprise to a lot of people. There's a lot of pain in the, in, the, in the middle of all that, but there's certainly a lot of gain at the end of it all. And that's the perspective. That's the long-term perspective we need to maintain. Because if you were a balanced investor, you did quite well as well. I mean, if you look at a balanced investor, 50% in the market, 50% call it out of the market in bonds, you end up with 907, 907,000, just shy of $1 million. Um, and again, if you were a bond investor, you end up in the green which is 351,000. So bonds offer stability. They offer income in retirement. They offer that bucket that we talk about a lot. It's a very important bucket when in retirement. In the accumulation phase, we don't want to have as much in the, the bond bucket, but it's all based on risk tolerance. That really what it comes down to, but we know long-term stocks give us what we need. Um, and bonds are there for, for certain reasons. A reactionary investor actually did okay. Um, not as well as stay in the course. That's why we talk about this market timing and we've yet to see a better result. We've yet to, we've yet to see a better system in, in, in that in place. Uh, but a reactionary investor, which is signified in the red there, uh, invests 50% uh, you know, in, in the S&P 500, 100% uh, moves out, moves 100% into 90-day T-bills. That was a short-term treasury bond I, I mentioned, mentioned. Each time the market drops 30% or more and then moves 100% back into the S&P 500 two years later ends up with a result, but not as great as just staying the course. Why? It's about missing days. It's about missing the great days. It's about missing the big up days. We saw in the last three weeks some really, really great up days. And if we weren't part of that, the, the markets were up 11 or 12% one day, 9% one day. If we miss out on those, that's why we end up versus the blue numbers versus the red numbers. It's those big days we miss that we just can't get back. And that's what they're saying. And if you own cash, a lot of people want to go to cash. A lot of people are going to cash based on what Chris just said in the mutual fund flow category there. A lot of people are going to cash. We know cash 
they say cash is king, um, but cash is not necessarily the best returning type of asset to own longer term. I think we know that, but it's interesting as we head into retirement and we get ready for this and we get ready for this moment, people want to hold their money tight to, their, tight to the vest and go in bonds and go in cash. It's a reactionary thing. It's a, it's a human emotion that we all go through. But we know, Chris, myself, Zach, Peter, uh, we all know that being retirement planning uh, specialists here is that that is not something is, that is a good idea longer term. So we try to really focus and, and get you to, to be that great investor, have the right mix long term to provide that income that we need uh, going forward for the next 20 to 30 years in retirement. Mm -hmm. Now there's Warren Buffett. There he, there he is. There's, there's my guy there. Money is like soap. The more you handle it, the less you have. And that just goes to shows about changing lanes. The more you play around with the money and the more you change things, and I'm going to anticipate this, or I think this is going to happen, the less you actually have. It's amazing going to a Berkshire Hathaway meeting and Charlie Munger and, and Warren Buffett sit up there and they drink Coke and they drink their peanut brittle. And it's really interesting to watch this. And people will ask, and, and the, the, the crowd tries to entice them. And they try to get them off their, off their message. And some people ask, what do you think is going to happen in the future? And their answer is, I don't know. Next question. <laughs> it's just an amazing thing where you have some of the most wealthy people in the world that have no idea what's going on, yet some people think that they do want, they know what's going on and, and they can actually handle the future and actually see the future. It's a very interesting thing and that, that I think uh, those people go through. So money's like soap. The more you handle it, the less you have. Very much true. Very much true. I think a good point that Ken made there too is a lot of times the people who actually probably have the least ability to know what's going on in the future believe that they do. That's a really great point. I think you look at that and say the smartest people that we find often say we don't know what's going to happen in the future, um, but we know what's happened in the past and we know what we think is good value. It's a really good point. Super good point. Thanks, Ken. It is very easy to get emotional. So key takeaway number two from all this, it's very easy to get emotional with your money given all the dramatic headlines. It did, if, if you are newly retired in this, uh, again, we can go back to, you know, giving each other hugs. I'm a hugger. Uh, my, my wife is Colombian. We hug each other. We kiss each other all the time. That's what we do. Um, but if, if you are newly retired, I, I want to give you a hug by, because this is, this is such a new thing you're going through. It's a very odd time that you're going through right now. Um, and I give you a lot of credit because we have quite a few retirees that are retiring right now. We're thinking about it and it's not an easy thing to go through. So those who are turning off the news and turning on the music, um, you know, going back to some, maybe some Eagles music, <laughs> uh, you know, it's always soothing and calming there, but, um, but I give you a lot of credit because this is not an easy time to go through, um, and not getting emotional about making those decisions. So key yeah. takeaway number two. Yeah. Good point with Ken, uh, as well as with new retirees. This isn't the end of life. This is just a downturn, which defines if you can make it in retirement right now, you got a great chance of having a great retirement beyond here. So it's an it's a excellent point. Excellent point. Thanks, Ken. This is might be your dog. So to any of you who've had this COVID, you can still get out and walk your dog, but that's the sixth walk today. What the heck is it, Corona? So kind of funny to see your dogs maybe feeling that way. So be careful. Don't take them out too much. You know, they're not used to walking eight or 10 times a day. So that's, that we thought was quite funny too. In the next section, we'll take a look at uh, here is how long can stocks stay down when the bear surfaces? And if you guys are paying attention during the webinar, remember that the bear, it's called a bear market because the bear attacks swiping down and the bull attacks swiping up with his head. So, uh, that's a funny one, but so how long can stocks stay down when the bear surfaces? And, and the biggest thing, as you've seen, the theme is that we have no future facts. We would absolutely love to tell you guys um, exactly when this is going to be over. We should put money in right now because this is the bottom. We would absolutely love to share that with you if we knew what that was. But the underlying theme that you've heard from us uh, through and through is, is no future facts. And so this is just to bring a little guidance and perspective and, and use history as a, as a learner, as a teaching tool for us of what we could potentially expect and maybe even the worst case scenario of what we've seen in the past. Uh, historically, patience has paid off. So we're looking at the Great Depression again here today of $10,000 invested in the S&P 500 index right at market peak, right before the Great Depression. 
our $10,000 within uh, three years went down to $2,200, which was the market bottom. So almost 80% of our money gone in less than three years and then fully recovered at the end of 1936. So patients paid off by the fact that we didn't sell when we were 80% down or um, even along the way at any point in time and got that money back a little over time. Another interesting point that goes along with that is if you were in the NASDAQ in 2000, it's almost the exact same experience if you're 100% NASDAQ invested in 2000. So just as an FYI, it correlates very close. And what was the investor experience during that exact same time frame, 1928 to 1936, again, a, almost an 80% temporary correction at one point. Um, the investors that did nothing recovered in four years and four months. The investor that bought more, remember if we started with 10,000 and added an additional 10,000 during that time recovered in three months. Uh, the investor that sold out realized a 78% loss and one year recovery from the market bottom was 137.6%. So we don't know when that's coming, never know when the market bottom was, could have been a month ago, could have been last week, could be the coming weeks ahead. Uh, but what history has taught us in the past is that the time frame after that has been historically very, very good. And if we're looking at, again, if we're keeping common themes of the Great Depression, the oil crisis, you know, the early 2000s, this one's taking a look at the oil crisis, the same exact uh, chart. In 1972, started with $10,000 invested in the S&P 500 index. Uh, at its market bottom, that 10,000 went all the way down to 5,600 temporarily. Uh, before, two years later, uh, we received a, about a 6% return ahead of our initial investment of $10,000, 10,662. So patients again, uh, paid off. And if we're looking at the investor experience during that time frame from 1972 to 1976, uh, the investor that did nothing recovered in one year and eight months. Uh, the investor that bought more added an additional 10,000 to the original $10,000 investment recovered in five months. The investor that sold out realized a 44% loss. And again, one year recovery from bottom, from market bottom was positive 44.46%. And again, this too shall pass and there's better days ahead. This is an interesting one. I'll, I'll hop in real quick. This is a, a chart that Peter brought up just recently. Um, he found it, I think, yesterday. And I thought it was a phenomenal piece. We've seen one as well like this where the Spanish flu, which if you look at that in 1918, so there's a ton of perspective in history we look at. And all I'm looking at is how does it seem compared to, I want to get myself into that period of time and see how it looks. Because one thing I know for sure, human fear exists all the time. Market events are simply when it shows itself with massive, rapid, immediate drops because the market can show the temperature of what's going on and how people are feeling in mass immediately in an open market every day. So when we saw this one, this is the 1987 crash versus the 2020 COVID crash. When you look at the two, this is 1987 uh, up to 2019, it looks almost exactly the same when you're looking at the percentage of drop and who knows exactly how it will recover, but it will recover over time. But very interesting to look at what fear does. Fear is very common, it's visceral. You've seen our, our uh, study many times on it in the statements we make, it's visceral. It happens very quickly. Um, but what you're gonna find as well, then hope begins to take over as well as things recover. So you're looking at just a two year period here, but it's looking at the same period of time for our, our markets and, and things that led right up to that 1987 and the 2020 um, correction and crash as well. So it's just a great piece to show you some of these things. And I know we don't send it. So one thing we don't like to do, and this is a tough presentation for us because we don't like to hide behind charts. One thing that we love to do is we love you to trust us because we're giving you good advice based on who we are, what we do and how we've always done it. Occasionally, we like to let you behind the curtain and see these kind of slide presentations to show you what we look at on a constant basis. What are we doing when uh, you don't hear from us? This is what we're doing. We're studying history. We're debating it. We're going back and forth on these pieces. But again, we find some great charts. Sometimes this is a great one to take a look at as well. We don't know what will occur from here, but it rhymes. It's not exactly the same, but it rhymes so far. Anyway, same things with the, 
1918 flu, very, very similar time frame. So a very, very similar drop. If we're just looking at uh, recovery rate of recovering 75% of that initial dollar value that we put in and 90% and 100% uh, during the Great Depression to recover 75%, it took three years and five months uh, to recover 90%. It was three years and nine months and 100% is four years and four months, which is very interesting because it took a very long time to get to that 75% back. But then from 75 to 100, it was fairly quick. And you'll see that trend here um, moving forward as well. And in the oil crisis, if we take a look back, uh, we have five months for the 75%, one year and four months for the 90% recovery, and one year and eight months. So once uh, the initial happens, it really flows very quickly after that. And if we look at the internet bubble, uh, seven months to recover the 75%, two years and four months, uh, for the 90% in three years and six months. And then in the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis, we had three years and four months recovery for 75%, three years and 10 months, and four years and one month for the 100% recovery. And so the reason why we've chosen these, as you can see, if we look back past the presentation, why we pulled these four is oftentimes during times like COVID-19, they pull the, the worst case scenarios. And so that's what we wanted to do as well, is pull some of the worst case scenarios that we've seen over the last 90, 100 years and show you as perspective what that has happened then and uh, what could potentially either happen moving forward or maybe not even at all, but just provide a little guidance and perspective of why we do what we do. That's a good point, Zach. I'll jump in here for just a second. Well, and I do a lot of reviews with, with a lot of you on the call right now and those who are gonna watch it after it's being recorded right now, um, I've heard, uh, on, on, on multiple occasions, you know, I don't know if I'll be around to see the recovery of this one. And my answer to that is historically, yes, you will. Yes, you will. So not easy to go through where I'm not minimizing that whatsoever, but I've heard that probably 10 or 15 times now. So that's why we wanted to show this slide. So, so we're there with you. Uh, this is not easy to go through. It doesn't provide any smiley faces in our reviews when we, when we do all talk about it. But uh, again, this too shall pass and history has, has taught us that. Thank you. And the key takeaway number three is historically, it does not take that long to recover from a bear market. The most significant gains tend to arise after the deepest declines. And just a little saying at the bottom, it's always darkest before the dawn. That's why we stick to the plan and the planning might adapt, but the plan, the plan might adapt, but the planning stays the same and the constant ideas that we're trying to bring to you. Thank you. And here's a, here's a, a little joke for you that when the hair salon is closed, uh, but your dog groomer has a cancellation. And the, the best part about this one is this is actually Mike Mann on our team and his current haircut. <laughs> I'm totally joking. I hope Mike is watching and I have to throw a little jabs in since I'm at home hiding here and not at the office. So, um, but uh, we love this one. This one That's good. cracked me up. Thank you. One of my neighbors has a standard poodle. So this actually fits in really well. It's pretty fun. Just a couple of ideas on how to survive a bear market. Uh, buy quality investments be broadly diversified, have a world-class asset managers, be patient. You'll see a lot of this, you know, faith, patience, and discipline are very, very important to us as well. So as you're looking at how to survive a bear market, I think this is a, a super important part of it. Next one is uh, things to consider in the midst of a bear market, kind of ranked by preference for us. And I think, uh, Ken, I'll let you go through these. Yeah, so number one, rebalancing the portfolio and use this as an opportunity to buy quality stocks at depressed prices. This is, this is something that, um, you know, we, we, we do with you during our phone calls. Um, we, we do rebalancing. So there's rebalancing on many different levels. A lot of people think it's, you know, bonds to stocks or stocks to bonds. That is one key element. Don't get me wrong on that one. There's other elements that Chris mentioned before, growth and value. Growth has been on, 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 a, on a long run right now. It's been, it's been dominant right now. But each and every year, we've been selling high on the growth and buying low on the value. Selling high on the growth, buying value. Think about if you were um, chasing dividends. You know, that one slide talked about 
changing lanes and, and trying to seek out something for yourself that you think may do better. A lot of times we hear from, from people about dividend, dividend yields. Dividend yields fall in that value category. Dividend type of paying companies fall into the value side of those cycles and those companies. So Kinder Morgan was one of those great examples that, you know, if you watch Kinder Morgan over the years, they had a seven to 10% dividend given any time frame that you look at. Um, and yes, it, it was a great paying dividend stock, but then all of a sudden the stock price dropped in half pretty quickly. So um, you, you look at a piece like that, growth and value is another way we rebalance. And you also take a look at large, small and mid-sized companies in the portfolio. Again, when you look at companies that are categories that have been affected the most, it's the small companies. It's the mid-sized companies. It's the emerging markets. So we are, we're, we're, as we rebalance, we shift money to those. So we're selling pieces at a high point and we're buying pieces at a low point. So that's the key to rebalancing. That's a very, very critical piece um, that we do very, very um, frequent uh, and consistent with you guys. Not to say frequent, but consistently with you guys. Leave the portfolio intact and let the market recover and bring it back into balance. Um, you know, that's, if, if we're not necessarily gonna rebalance, this is a great way to do it. So leave it, leave the portfolio intact. Don't abandon the strategy. Don't abandon categories. Typically, the categories that bring us down and are affected the most lead us, lead us out, out of that. That's just history speaking right there. Uh, but leaving the portfolio intact is number two. Number three is converting pre-tax money to a Roth. So we've talked about this a couple times on our previous webcasts. Uh, great time to convert money that's in a 401k that wasn't a 401k or any money that you have in IRAs that are pre-tax money to, to the Roth IRA. As, you, as a lot of you know, when the money's in the Roth IRA and we get that springing back uh, when, that, when that happens, the earnings and the recapture in the Roth IRA, which aren't subject to to income taxes, even on the earnings when you pull the dollars out. So it's a very great planning opportunity. It's a great way to go on the offensive rather than the defensive um, and just convert pre-tax money to a Roth if it makes sense. It doesn't make sense for everybody. Uh, it really comes down to what your time frame of money is, what the purpose of your money is. So this is a very specific you know, case by case situation. Um, and these are the conversations that we have with you on the telephone to see if it, see if it makes sense. And this is something we've been identifying as well with clients that we'll reach been reaching out to you if this makes sense. So it's always okay to ask the question, but we're often been reaching out if it makes a lot of sense as well. So this is something we've looked over the accounts for to see if there's opportunities already. And number four here is a strategy we never recommend is move some or all of your stocks out of the markets until the dust settles. That, that is something that we'll never recommend. Um, again, it just doesn't, it doesn't give us the history. You know, we do not recommend this since historically the markets, the markets tend to rebound significantly before investors regain the confidence to buy in. Um, you know, we've heard many, many times, not from you watching or, or listening, uh, from other people that are out there um, that, you know, we'll, we'll just wait till it feels better. It's too, it's too late. If it feels better, the markets have already, uh, remember, the markets are very anticipatory. They, they want to look to the future. Um, and it, we might be seeing that right now. No one knows what we're seeing right now, but um, that's what the markets tend to do. And when, when, they, when it feels better for everybody, it's, it's too late. So stay the, keep the course, look at the financial plan, look at the retirement plan, keep the strategy, do not abandon it, and, um, and, and good things typically happen. Key number, take number, number four, very, very simple, yet not easy. Be patient. Faith, patience, and discipline. Um, you can look at, you know, we're talking about money right now. We're talking about your retirement scenario right now. But you can look at this in almost every scenario in life. Could be with children. Could be with spouses. Could be with grandparents. Could be with positions, careers. I mean, those who are, tend to be patient typically uh, get rewarded because of the patience. Thank you. How to reduce the sting of a bear market. Too many of you have been through uh, three of these now with myself, if you've been with me since the beginning, and many of you have, uh, some of you have been uh, more recent clients, but it's how do you reduce the sting of a bear market? We're, these are pieces we put together about corrections. You've seen those. Um, how do we reduce them? Some of them are looking at your wants, needs, and wishes, and really looking at needs now, spending on those, and maybe putting off wants and wishes. So there's some things like that, which we've shown you and talked about before. What we want to show you here are some of the technical items we see 
you know, some of the pieces, as Ken talks about before, and he's done this with a lot of times, is tax loss harvesting. Um, you know, as, as we look to your portfolio, you've heard from Peter, you've heard from all of us saying, here's a few items that we could actually make some lemonade out of lemons. So this is what we look at when we say that. So we wanted to give you some of the technical pieces and what does this mean? So essentially it means this, when you look at a fun family, this is just an illustration. We have a growth investment, that's a single investment we have, and it's here's growth investment A, right? When we want to capture a loss, we simply move to growth investment B. And here's the case. In some cases, people move back after 30 days. In our case, we just moved to growth investment B that was our number one or two choice, capture the loss and let the recovery happen on the upside. So what's interesting about this, there's a couple of ways to do it, but the whole point is to take a loss when the market corrects, harvest it. When it recovers, you'll have your recovery, but you'll also have a tax loss to offset taxes in the future as well. So tax loss harvesting has been a big part of what we're looking at for taxable accounts. IRAs, it doesn't count for, but this is something we've done for the last uh, 20 years whenever we get the opportunity to as well. How much tax loss carry forward is enough? As much as you can get in our opinion. So when you look at this, we talked to quite a few certified public accountants and our, and our uh, peers as well. And this is a big piece. We'd love to have that available to offset uh, capital gains in the future, even if it's above what you have for the present year. So key takeaway five, when markets are, lem are, are a lemon, let's make lemonade. So that's a lot of what Ken's been talking about with the conversions, the rebalancing, the, the key takeaway number five in tax loss harvesting as well. So we're always looking for how we can make, a, a, make good out of a bad situation. So how do stock valuations look compared to other alternatives? Now, I, I did warn you, so before we go to this one, I did warn you, this is a long, arduous program. We're going to give you a ton of information here. We've already passed over an hour. I get it. So if you want to stand up and stretch, you can do that in the comfort of your home. We cannot see you on camera. So it depends if you're wearing a nice sweatshirt and you're wearing a, you know, swimming trunks or something. We're not going to know that. That's okay. You can stand up and walk around. We can't see your, your cameras. We've made sure those are turned off. Um, but just as an FYI, so as we go through here, we've got probably uh, maybe 20, 25, 30 minutes or so. We're not going to hit a ton of data points on these next ones. We're not going to uh, articulate a lot on them, but it's kind of an interesting piece to see what we have and, and how do you reduce the, the sting of a bear market and, and then how do stock values look today compared to other investments. So Zach, I'll let you, I'll let you move into that. Perfect. And uh, like Chris mentioned, this one uh, is chart based. And some of the print might be fairly small, but we're going to pull a few major points that weren't maybe potentially touched on before, or at least pull them out just a little bit further. And we're just looking at the S&P's past record high from January 1 of 2000 to March 31st of 2020, just to provide a little perspective of the different time frames we were talking about. And uh, an uptrend, like Chris said, like this, if you look at it from start to finish, punctuated by these short-term intermittent temporary declines. Um, and that's what's going to continue to happen in the future as well. Awesome. And if we're just looking at uh, a couple of different um, kind of nerdy economic facts that we absolutely love and, and dive into, we'll try to, to spare you, but it's just to look at uh, the different trends over 2000, 2007, uh, 2019, uh, right before um, COVID and, and this recent temporary decline. So the S&P 500, its price is the first line, um, 1,500, 1,527 in 2000, uh, 1,565 in 2007, and 3,231 at the end of 2019, and then a temporary um, downturn of 2,585 at the end of March. In the middle of March, it was even less than that. We had a little recovery towards the end of March as well. Uh, but the earnings per share, uh, we're looking at the earnings of the companies relative to their share price, uh, fairly in line, and they haven't gone down too significantly since the end of 2019, which was fairly surprising to see. If we're looking at 2019, we have $177 uh, earnings per share, and right now we're at about $167 per share. Um, dividends, again, right fairly in line during this time frame, trending upward and trending upward by a lot if we're looking over the 20 year time frame. Uh, but over this last recent correction, uh, still fairly in line to where it was right before um, the temporary correction. And the forward price to earning ratio is one that we really look forward to looking at and even the, the price to earnings ratio looking backward as well. Uh, but right now, if we're looking at, if, if you look at 2000, 
27 times forward price to earnings ratio. Things were very overvalued at the time, and it makes sense why there was a tech bubble of some sort at that time frame when we look back with 2020 hindsight. And we're, what's really interesting is at 2007, uh, 15.7 forward price to earnings per share. And right now, as of 331 of 2020, uh, almost exactly the same, 15.4. So 10-year uh, treasury is really interesting to look at just as far as the trend of going from 6.20 to currently where it's at to 0 0.70, less than a percent. And that's going to be the next point that we're going to try to drive in here is yield. One thing before we go to the next slide, Zach, what's pretty interesting is the peak, I think, was in February of that year of a 34 price to earnings forward ratio. So the January, February of 2000 was phenomenal, uh, but that's what it started at. That's what it peaked in February before it had the inevitable fall. And this is this is the main point that we're trying to, to drive home on this one is we were looking at price most of the time when we look back at um, those charts that we showed earlier in the presentation. Now we're going to look at yield, specifically dividend yield and the 10-year treasury earnings yield. We're looking back through 2000. The upward trend of the S&P 500 yield in 2000, it was 3.66 upwards to 6.37 in 2007, 5.49 in 2019 went down a little bit during that time frame but then now the dividend earnings yield is 6.49 percent and if we're looking at the treasury yield uh 6.2 in 2000 all the way to less than a percent that's a yield advantage not price just yield of 5.79 percent difference between the s p and the 10-year treasuries no, that's a treasury earnings yield, just as remember that by everybody out there. It's not the dividend on the actual S&P 500. So just as an FYI, but it's an incredible piece to look at. The inversion of value from 2000 to today is massive. That's a great point, Zach. Uh, just some valuation observations. Uh, even if the S&P earnings were to temporary plunge, compared to the historically low yields in cash and treasuries, uh, they could be viewed as a bargain, just looking at historic prices and earnings yields as well. And when profits recover, as they have in the past, hang on to your hat. <laughs> just a funny little one. Absolutely. And uh, this one's really interesting as well. Uh, we're just looking at S&P 500 earnings per share, and we're looking at the S&P consensus analyst estimates. Uh, where the lines pointing down is at the end of the fourth quarter of 2019 and their forward projections were already kind of, if you remember the definition of a recession with two consecutive quarters of lower earnings and reduced GDP, uh, they're kind of looking towards that, looking forward and then accelerated after these, after the economic impact is evaluated and kind of gone through with what COVID-19 has affected so far. Thank you, Zach. And this is just another way to show the chart and the kind of the inversion between the forward earnings yield of the S&P and the nominal 10-year treasury bond yield. They stayed fairly in line uh, if we're looking back from 1979 all the way from 2000 or 1979 to currently to today. And starting in about 2000, that's where it started to invert a little bit more and the furnace the forward earnings yield started to create a little bit more of a gap between the 10-year treasuries. So this is a good one. This is the COVID rescue team. So you'll see them there. St. Bernard's with toilet paper. Love that one. So that way, anybody who needs it, they run around, they'll find that you've run out. So this is the five essentials to successful wealth management. These are just some of the principles that go along with it, because this is interesting. There's a lot of background data here, but what do you do with this? So what are the five essentials to wealth management? One, you must have faith in the future. Pessimists are doomed. So if you look at a book I read called Land of Hope uh, by Wilfred McClay, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal book to show that we are a land of hope. This is in our DNA. So one thing we always try to provide with you is faith in the future. This is a land of hope. We will come up with some cures for this. We will get through it. We'll come out on the other side better and prepared for the next uh, the next downturn of whatever it occurs to be, or the next 
um, let's call it the next um, pandemic of whatever that's going to be. So one thing is essential facing the future. Reasons to stay positive. COVID's a new version of the flu. And even though it's new, we have a fighting chance of the front lines of encouraging progress on new vaccines and a treatment. The number who has recovered is often not reported on the news. And as people recover, we believe uh, that every, as people recover, we believe everything will recover. Now what's interesting here as well as in the call that we had this weekend, it's, it's interesting to find what some of the, the reasons to stay positive. We have more people looking for ways to A, prevent, vaccinate, uh, and also cure you when you have this than we've ever seen before on a more rapid basis. The timing for us to do this now is wildly fast because we have technology we've never seen before. We're taking the virus apart and figuring what makes it tick and what it's doing to the body. And then how do we reverse those? So it, it may be the fact that people do, uh, do have this, but we come up with something to say, but here's how we then fight that. So these are the cocktails and things that are coming up. Just like with HIV, it took a very long time. This time with this flu 20 years later, this is, it's, much, much quicker. So that's one reason to stay positive. We see more and more good news. One reason to stay positive as well, and this is for you who haven't been on here yet, uh, but has anybody here seen the SGN with John Krasinski? It's the Some Good News Network. It's something that I watched him do. And if you look on YouTube, it's on there. He's got two or maybe three shows of it so far. But if you want to cry a little bit because of how the good nature of people is coming out, it's one reason to stay positive as well. Look at what the good is coming out. You're seeing entire hospital staffs, entire police offices come out and and clap for the people who are caring for people in the hospital. I mean, you're seeing massive, incredible things occur. Um, you're going to see something very cool. I won't spoil the the, the uh, I won't spoil the surprise, but something very cool if you're a, a Hamilton fan on one of these as well. Another reason to stay positive as well. If you look at some of the new cases, if you look across the board here, have been you know subsiding in Italy and also in New York as well. They believe, but you know we don't know exactly what they, they could spike again. We're not sure about that, but a, a positive future may not be months out, it may not be years out, as some people are saying as well. So some of that's a positive that we can see beginning with some of the trends. Another couple of reasons to stay positive is that we fully expect a coronavirus recession. Uh, this is very interesting. With a lot of job losses now, really the ensuing recovery can be expected. So a lot of my clients who own companies or are high up in companies or own them, I asked them this question. If they had to furlough a few employees, I asked them, when this ends, are you going to hire them back quickly? They said, oh my gosh, as soon as it ends, we're going to hire them back. And try to take other people's employees because we can't find enough. So there's going to be a pent up demand. It's like a spring. I think Ken's shown this sometimes. It's like a spring coil. And it's a great illustration to show when you get to the other side, if you coil the spring a whole lot, it tends to pop up the other side. That is what we look at too with potentially hiring once this is over as well. Now, will it be a different economy? We're going to return to a new normal. As Ken said, we may have, you know, screening devices for temperature when you walk into a Bucks game. You know, we don't know exactly what that'll look like, but the, the key is we'll return to our new normal and probably sooner than you think. Um, Fed's unprecedented injection of liquidity has been huge for the global economy, and they've committed to supporting our cities as well. So they've got money behind municipal bonds. They've really just thrown incredible tools at this because they learned from the past downturns. Congressional tax and unemployment benefits. As a matter of fact, some of you might be receiving your stimulus checks now. I know we were talking with a couple of people in the saying their friends have received them just recently as well. So those are coming out with congressional tax and unemployment benefits, energy cost declines. So for anybody who's traveling, I don't know, I haven't put gas in my car for six weeks, probably. I'm a little concerned that uh, it may become stale. So if you know what time frame that happens in, let me know. But you're looking, my mom showed me this weekend gas at 98 cents in Iowa. So kind of an interesting point. I don't remember the last time I saw single or double digit gas, but that was pretty impressive. Uh, usually double digit gas to us, we're believing it would have been $10. So again, energy cost declines have gone down tremendously. You've seen oil fall through the floor as well, which is a couple of different reasons as well. But yeah, Chris, a, Chris, yeah. 1998, gas was 97 cents a gallon. Wow. I was, in, I was a senior in high school. Wow. <laughs> and I know that ago. because I had a moped and I could fill it up for a dollar <laughs> and you could drive a whole week with your friends, you know? That's craziness. <laughs> that is craziness. Yeah, 1998, that was, that's crazy. At any rate, thank you. That, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> Observation of China's recovery showing a meaningful improvement in discretionary spending. You're seeing a lot of their factories reopen. You're seeing a lot of, uh, not a lot of, from what we're hearing from news anyway, not a lot of new cases being shown as well. So there's, remember, one thing I want to say about exponentials, and this was a great one from Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates had a great, um, I think it was a video I saw, or a, I think it was maybe a stream that I saw as well from him and one of the groups I'm in. But he showed this thing exponentials go two ways. If one person infects four daily, you're going to see a massive rise. And if you do projections in an exponential basis, you can make really unbelievable predictions that are well off the charts. The same thing happens if we're only infecting 0.4. If one person who gets infected infects only 0.4 people, 
exponentials go the other direction to completely eliminate it also very quickly. So the thing is, when you're talking exponential viruses, either direction leads to massive pandemic or massive extinction very quickly. So it's an interesting point to go when people are making these. I think, uh, what was it, Dr. Fauci actually said this. He started working, 2 million people could die. So it would be 200,000 people could die. And then a few weeks later said, well, maybe it's 65,000. And he apologized. He says, these mathematical equations that we're working on a forward basis, they aren't, you know, they aren't proven. We don't know exactly what they will be, but they have to use them for modeling. So it's a very interesting piece to see as you're going forward. Other reasons to stay positive. Don't underestimate the scientific abilities and medical solutions uh, to this and future pandemics. This is John Pierpont Morgan, JP Morgan. To bet against America is to go broke. If you look at this, historically, these kind of crises, I do a ton of reading of economic history. Uh, when you look at this just for the sake of, of, of positions in history, these are the kind of things that propel us to the next category to, you know, once we get through it propel us to be prepared and actually thrive on the other side of it. That's what America is. It's a land of hope. And this should provide hope on a go forward basis once we get through the pain of what's happening right now. Um, all the reasons to say positive growth in population. The United States has had massive growth in population. That's huge. The United States GDP has like quadrupled since 1975. So massive growth is pretty interesting to see. These four to eight billion people as well they're going to become consumers and they want to buy normal things in the world. So we're going to see massive increase over time just in their demand. Also, they're now being connected. So there's a lot of really good signs in the world. There's still some updates. For those of you who got to read some of the technology, the technology that's coming out right now is being covered up somewhat by what's happening here. Very, very, very interesting to see what's, what's been going on here. Um, so if you look at this, uh, it's, it's really, really cool um, to see a lot of huge technology gains as we're going forward. I know somebody just raised their hand on the video here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to hold off uh, some of the questions, if you will, and raising hands unless maybe you can email somebody because uh, right now I want to make sure we get through this in under four hours. Um, so if you look at this too, the stocks remain actually, uh, inflation remains fairly low, dividends than the S&P and CPI. If you go to 1960 to the day, the increase in the S&P is up 56 times. Earnings are up 52. They follow each other very, very closely. Dividends are up 33 times. And the cost of everything we buy is only up nine the affordability factor is off the charts in, the, in this decade as well. Uh, and this is a question Ken said earlier. And this is, we've heard clients say this, but, but I don't have time. I don't have, I'm, I don't have a 40 year horizon. I only have 10. Well, you've seen in most cases, as Zach brought that up before, it's only a three to four year time frame to recover from most of the major bear markets in the, in the past. So as we look at that, it's, it's a great point. Don't get us wrong. We understand it. We understand how you feel. And others have felt the exact same way. What we found is when you look at the data, it still supports even owning stocks in those kind of time frames as well. And, and this is a chart we looked at before. If you look at history, this is back in 1929 to 1930. We had one period of time here. We also had two 10 year periods of time here in 2008 where we had negative returns on the S&P 500. Negative returns on the S&P 500. So when I look at this, it's kind of amazing to see. Here's another chart that shows it. This is where the market 10 years uh, in 10 year periods of time the market's provided a 3% turn or greater 90% of the time. And look at this. Some of these are 20% per year for 10 years. When you start looking at what that'll do to your compounding, if you run a little calculator, try 20% per year for 10 years on your calculator and see what that will do. And you'll see that often happens after times that have been quite rough, both here as well during recoveries. So we're just in the beginning of this recovery. I can't tell you exactly what will happen, but there could be some great opportunities going forward from this as well. Other reasons to stay positive are, are 10 year returns. And this is one question we get a lot. How about our nation's debt? Uh, since 2008, our nation's debt has increased 15.1 trillion. So what's interesting is ourselves, 6 trillion, the public's 17 trillion. So it's gone up $23 trillion. That's as of March of 2020. Um, this is what's very interesting. So I just told you that our, our household net worth or our household debt has gone up 6 trillion. Our household net worth has gone up 48 trillion. They never talk about this in the news. So we reached a 70% uh, uh, increase from the peak of the last uh, 2007 time frame, if you will, nobody was talking about the fact that we have more affordability and actually have much lower debt load in each one of the houses than we've ever had as well. The news doesn't talk about this. We want to bring that up to you as well. So when you look about this, compare our nation's debt to household net worth. When you look at this, this is basically looking at 71 trillion as a household net worth back in 2007. The peak we reached in fourth quarter last year was $120 trillion. So you look at that as over a 50% increase of, of just household net worth. It's about 60% higher than it ever has been, yet our debt load is down here at 23 trillion. So that's looking at this, our equity to our actual debt is a significant, significant, uh, significantly above the debt that we currently have to, uh, to society. And then here's the 
household debt service ratio as a percentage of disposable income. Again, there's so many statistics we get and read all the time. This is a good one though, because I had some conversation with my brother-in-law and my father-in-law about these as well. Is it seems to me like today, it, should, it costs a whole lot more to raise a family than it ever has. When you look at it, debt payments as a percentage of disposable personal income have actually gone down pretty significantly, even lower than they were in the 80s. And so we might argue in the 60s, it was very similar to this as well. So this is an interesting piece as well. We've actually, our, our financial households are more in order, which is really interesting to see as well. Unlike the Great Depression and Great Recession, where people had a lot of debt and leverage, 2000, in 1929, people leveraged 10 times in the market. When that happened, they could lose everything and more. So you look at household today being some of the lowest it's been in recorded history. It's actually a very strong positive, um, noting that banks are very well capitalized due to what happened in 08 as well. We required them to be too. So that suggests the nation's in even a better place to recover from this pandemic than we have been in the past. Essential number two, you must be patient. Historically, the stock market will always, has always risen over the long run, but can handle substantial or can decline substantially in the short run. So let me say it again. The stock market's always risen over time, but they get declined substantially in the short run as emotions run high. So we look at this, that the market declines have always been temporary in the long-term uptrend. That's essential number two. Uh, let, me, let me do this. Ken, I want to unmute you. you. Uh, since you got the Warren Buffett tie on, can you do the Warren Buffett quote? Yeah, I'll do the Warren Buffett quote. Let me move my videos here. So this is another great quote for about being patient. The market is the most efficient mechanism anywhere in the world for transferring wealth from the impatient people to the patient people. And it's just well said. I mean, it's a very simple statement, but it's just well said. And uh, that's the one thing we all, I think we all appreciate from, from Warren Buffett is that he makes things very simple and they can be. Um, those who are patient, you, you look at what he's done and why he's made money and why people make money, why you make money in the markets, why we rebalance. Think about what we're doing there. I mean, some of the best investments he made was in American Express, Wells Fargo. Those companies were not doing so well when he invested into them. There has to be some faith. There has to be some patience. There has to be um, this, this, this transfer of, um, of trust when it doesn't necessarily feel right. Um, and that's how you make money. And that's, how, that's why we rebalance you so much um, you know, when we talk about it so much because it has a big, big impact on your wealth. I think Buffett has two T's in it, but that might be the buffet. I'm not sure. This is the warm buffet. Yeah, this is different. This is a <laughs> different site, different, different key. So. <laughs> Zach? Yeah. If we're looking at uh, essential number three, if we're moving forward, is broadly diversify across and within asset classes, stocks, bonds, and tangibles. This will assure that you never make a killing in the market, but also help to make sure that you never get killed. And that's the purpose right now for most of us investors isn't to absolutely continue to make more and more and more money. It's to protect what we have and produce income off of it. And that's where this essential number three of diversifying across and within asset classes is so important. And if we're looking at a hypothetical diversified portfolio, uh, the percentages might be a little bit different than your own, but it's set up very similarly. And it's a composition of, of bonds of some form of the amount. It may not be 40%, maybe more, maybe less, depending on your personal situation. Uh, but then some large US company stocks. And if you guys were paying attention in Fundamentals 101, you know exactly what all of this means. You know, when we say small U.S. company stocks, international stocks, you know exactly what that means based off of that presentation. So I don't even have to go into detail. <laughs> but um, if we continue on with Investment 101 forward in the future, we can go through and, and tell you how we choose each of these different companies within here and kind of how we track them, too. If that's of interest to you guys and we hear feedback on that, we can definitely do that. But a great portfolio is a combination of all of these because we don't know which one will do better when, and that's also why rebalancing comes in as well. Yeah. Central number four, use discipline to rebalance the portfolio once per year. year. Sell high, buy low. That's, that's exactly what we've been talking about. It reiterates, and it's so important that we put it in here because we reiterated three or four times. That's the importance of it all. So selling high, buying low, again, across categories, across stocks and bonds, uh, across, different size, across different sizes of companies. That's why we use this. Um, so that's why we talk about rebalancing the portfolio once per year. We've typically, we, we've done a big research on this. So we've done a lot of research and we understand it, that 
if we rebalance too too often, so we've gotten this question before about rebalancing why you do what when you do it, um, because we have to let the the cycle or or the trend run a little bit, like because otherwise you 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 cut it off too soon from letting it happen. And so we've done we've done studies and we've looked at quarterly rebalancing, we've looked at semi-annual rebalancing, we've looked at annual, and annual really gives us the best result longer term that we're looking for. So that's some of the reason why we do it annually and not as, not as frequent. Now, if you have a 401k, sometimes we recommend it quarterly, sometimes we recommend it semi-annually because you're constantly putting money in. And so that's why you might've heard that from us before, but once a year typically is optimal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Ken. Essential number five is be very, be very tax and cost conscious in designing the portfolio. Uh, gross return, less cost is less taxes is what, what you get. So again, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. We're, we're big fans of that. You know, we live in America, so let's pay what we should and no more. Um, but that's, that, that's just being tax co conscious about it. That's talking about what Chris talked about as far as tax loss harvesting in, in trust accounts and personal accounts. Again, you know, we, need, we need to make lemonade where there's lemons and that's what we do for you. And that's what we're trying to do on a consistent basis. So uh, one piece we'll look at as well here is, uh, this is a good one. This is quarantined with Hubby for two weeks. Gertrude is knitting something special for him. <laughs> so we're always concerned about people together, uh, being there together for a long time. I've found in our family, it's been amazing how well we all get along. We're getting along better and better and we're together more, which is an interesting. I'm getting to know my daughters and my wife even better and I love it. We're getting along phenomenal. I really appreciate this time and I'm really grateful for it. We know that's not always the case because sometimes emotions can get kind of high. You can go off the, it's easiest to be a little bit more um, uh, maybe impatient with those people who are closest to you because you take them for granted. So we want to say, work on your own mental uh, thought process to this as well. Be very careful during this time because it is times that people are sensitive and you may want to tell somebody, just stop talking or don't do that or don't make that noise. Be patient with them. Flip it around when you feel that. Flip it to appreciation versus, versus being maybe derogatory toward them. See what that does. You'll find it may actually just help you more than it even helps them. So a couple of pieces, you know we talk about that quite a bit, but one of the things I wanna say, we may never again take for granted. We may never again take for granted Friday nights with friends, birthday celebrations, the roar of a stadium, mornings at the gym, coffee with a friend, crowded concerts, happy hours. I know some of you will, will definitely look forward to that and are doing it via Zoom, but life itself, I don't know about many of you, but let me, be, let me be honest with yourself. So if you start looking at your own mortality, this has been some times that I've been able to look at my own mortality and go, oh my gosh, you know, what if something happens? What if, and done some things that I probably wouldn't have done, like writing more on my ethical will and you know, gathering more of my data for my, my you know, future um, children, or great, great grandchildren that I may not meet as well. So it's just making a lot of opportunity to do those and be introspective. I've been looking at doing a lot of things I think that I haven't done in the past, but I have felt some of those same things was mortality. My wife actually made a statement recently, but it's interesting. She's beginning just had this feeling of what it feels like to be in an oppressed country that you can't go out of, like China, where you're numbered when you go out, where if you're seen out and you're not supposed to be, they take money out of your account for, for jaywalking or doing whatever. So she says she's just beginning to feel what that feels like. And boy, that's really not America. So we won't stand for it. We'll stand for it when it helps save lives now because we need to. But I think you'll find when it's, when it's all freer, we get this test and we figure out how to, to move on again. Uh, one of my good friends was on a phone call yesterday. He manages about 100 of the uh, PGA Tour members. Um, and he's on one of the boards I'm with. Says that they think the PGA may start June 8th, for any of those golf fans. It's an interesting, but it's going to be without spectators. And the NBA has been talking heavily about getting everybody together down in uh, Las Vegas and simply running games every three hours to finish up the playoffs. So they're trying to find ways around it. They're working on adaptability. You may disagree with them, may agree with them, but... It's a very interesting piece, I think, as we see uh, on a, on a go-forward basis as well. But these are things, just look forward to the things you can appreciate. Pull out your gratitude journal that we gave to you and each one of you have. And maybe just write down today after this some of the things you're grateful for. Um, before I go to thank you, what I want to do as well, there's a couple pieces that I wanted to mention. Uh, one is some good news. So I'm going to do the Some Good News Network, SGN. I'm going to steal that from John Kaczynski. Well, I want to mention one of our clients recently let us know that their, her cancer is in remission. So for all of you, I want to do a little celebration for Sue Shamlin. Sue, you know you're out there. You've been fighting this. That's awesome that your cancer is in remission. We completely appreciate it. The entire team here cheered when I told them. So I want to make sure that you know that we care about that as well. Please share good news with us. I want to turn some of this into the Some Good News Network just for us and our community if we can as well. 
because we know that's super important for us all to have hope, inspire each other, and support each other. Those are super important pieces. One other piece of business before I leave us as well, there's something coming on called Regulation BI. It's called Regulation Best Interest. Basically, by April 24th, we have to, um, we're going to get all this disclosures about this Regulation Best Interest that's not being delayed because of COVID virus. The only thing that's not being delayed are the regulations that they're putting in. Um, tax has been pushed off, you know, RMDs have been, uh, but Regulation BI, which always the regulators are doing in our industry, haven't. So you're going to want to log on to your computer if you're on online access and go to the client account services tools and select, I want to receive all my documents online only. So that may include statements, deposit accounts, loan accounts held at Raymond James. But what we're going to do is we'll have Lisa, Peter, or Ashley and the, and the team send out what to do for this Regulation BI because you're going to get a bunch of stuff coming up from it in a probably sometime in April or May, I think, as we go through. Um, we want that actually to be a great idea. So you, sometimes it'll be print and mail for those of you who want it. But that was one thing the team wanted me to, to share as well. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about this. Next week, we're going to we go back to our, our 30 minute or less, um, uh, let's call it webcast, if you will, and talking more about some of the timeless issues. But we want to talk about the timed issues. So I really mean this because you guys have been great with it. Send us any suggestions, things you want to learn more about, if it's Zach's corner, if it's Ken's planning, if it's my perspective, whatever they are. Let's go. Please let us know things you want to learn more about. Because I've had a couple of clients say, hey, where can I go to get a great investment 101? I said, hey, great. We're going to start putting it on. Zach and is going to run through that. You know, what about some of the planning ideas? Ken, let's, let's talk some more about some of these planning ideas as well. Perspective ideas. We can all contribute to that. But you are the main reason we do this. I want to make sure you understand that. You are why we do what we do. You make it easy for us to do it. You know, putting things off, missing a spring break when you need us, those things happen and we believe it. That's the adaptability. Thank you again for your adaptability. Thank you for listening to an hour and a half of us or an hour and 45 minutes of us going on and on with some technical presentation. There's more. If you want more, we can probably go on for 10 hours, um, but we won't, we won't bore you with that. But thank you most of all for your trust. We're winning awards, and I mean to say we, you are winning awards for one of the best practices in America. You are. We want to make sure you understand that's how we view it. These are yours. So when you see something announced, I want you to understand, we don't celebrate it with an ego base here. We celebrate it with a congratulations to you base. That's how we operate. It's how Ken operates, how myself operates, Peter, Zach, you know, our entire team, Lisa, Julie, Ashley, Kristen, um, Angela. So as we go through this, uh, Mike, all of us are here for you. Just make sure you know that, you understand it. Thank you for all your questions. The first question we get when we're on the phone with you is, hey, how are you doing? Good, my family's great. We're very fortunate. We've been abiding by all the house restrictions. I don't think my daughters have been outside of the house other than the front yard or riding on their bike probably in four weeks. They're doing school at home as well. I think it's very similar to, to Ken's family, everybody's family. So we're doing minimal, but we're trying to make sure we, we do our part to save this off for you and for everybody, if you will. We'll all be very excited. We, we can leave the house again um, in a comfortable basis. But I want to thank you one more time for, for all of us. Uh, thank you for tuning into this as well. Uh, we'll go back to our box and Zoomcast next week, like I've mentioned. But also, I want to do one more thing. I want to ask you a question. If you would like, from time to time, we might send like a little inspiration from time to time on just a, maybe every couple of day basis. Uh, if you'd like little videos like that, let us know. They're one and two minutes, just super small, but just something to give a little inspiration or something we've seen that's super interesting that day. Uh, just let us know if you think that would be something you'd benefit or enjoy as well. We have to get them compliance approved when we send them out to y'all, but, but they won't be quite as timely because of that. They may be one day delayed, but we want to be able to do that for you as well. So let us know the best delivery method for you because that's what we're here for. We don't do this just for ourselves. We do this for you and it's a basis of serving you. So we want to make sure we know what you would like in this as well. So please share this with us. And I'll end with a, with a challenge. Be as grateful as possible. Be as giving as possible. Organizations and people are hungry. They're out of work. They're out of jobs. If you're retired and you have a great income, if you're still working, have a great income. Be very, it feels really good when you do something for someone else. We know we want to protect ourselves first, but a lot of times you're finding people taking their own health and serving other people to, to help protect them more than anything else. So I just want to encourage you to be able to do that piece as well. Thank you again for listening. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for, for my entire team. What I want to also give a shout out to and say my gratitude to, I've got 19 members here that are absolutely phenomenal. They have allowed this experience during what's gone on for all of you to be reached out to, for all of you to be talked to, for, for us to be heard, for you to be serviced. Well, they have done a phenomenal, extraordinary job. If I could really nominate them for practice of the year, I would nominate those nine and take my name out of it. They've done a phenomenal job with that. I just want to make sure I've seen the dedication of each one, the things that they've done for you is really, really exceptional. So when the crisis gets here, we step up. Most advisors, when the crisis get here, step back. We want to make sure that you understand that with our service. So thank you once again. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your Wednesday.